Hey, hey, Eli, guess what I'm going to remember to do right now? Boom. Yeah. <laughs> we got the badge. We remember the badge this time. Gotta have that beam, you know? Yeah, you got that beam. Yeah, yesterday we <laughs> was like, I didn't even see your text messages and everything. All right, so uh, we're going to just start inviting people on up in just a moment. We got a lot of, there's a lot of news today. A lot of little news, simple news, uh, and a lot of, you know, like updates. But, you know, of course, we have our daily Spotify. How you doing, Eli? I'm, I'm doing okay. I couldn't get the dog to come in just now. I was like coaxing. Come on, buddy. It's time for <laughs> the music news power hour. All right. I'm just going to start pinging just a couple people up. If you want to just hang out on the stage, uh, if there's sort of something to join in, or uh, I'm just going to Elliot. There we go. All right. And uh, we are just about to get started here. We're going to go into the countdown any minute. I want to just start pinging some people in. All right. So, and we are now going into the countdown. We are live. Welcome to the Music News Power Hour on the Music Industry City Broadcast Network. Today, we are going to talk about the CDC says no masks for some outdoor activities. 17,000 apply for the shuttered venue operating grant. New York City Hardcore Show has their future permits pulled. Songwrites call for a daily allowance and the effects of the secretly grouped union and what that means for the independent music industry, plus your daily Spotify update. It's Wednesday. We have a lot to discuss, but first, let's welcome my co-host, Eli Window. Eli, good to see you. How are you doing? Peter, how you doing? It's great to be here. It is Wednesday. Happy hump day to everybody. Shall we go ahead and get started? We've got a lot of news to cover today. I, I know. we got so much in the play. It's jam-packed. So, yeah, why don't you kind of break yeah. into it with this day in history. All right, let's get started. Today we remember from 1980 the death of Marshall Tucker Band bass player Tommy Caldwell, who died of injuries from a car accident, aged 30, in his hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina. Caldwell was the original frontman for the Marshall Tucker Band between 1973 and 1980 in memory. And also in memory, on this day in 2020, American rock and roll and rhythm and blues singer Bobby Lewis died age 95. He's best known for his 1961 hit singles, Tossin' and Turnin'. And finally, it was announced yesterday that legendary recording engineer Al Schmidt died Monday at the age of 91. He had 20 Grammy wins for his work with artists from everyone, from Ray Charles to Paul McCartney to Natalie Cole to Steely Dan. He won more Grammy awards than any other engineer in music history passed away on monday in memory al schmidt moving on birthdays today born on this day 1952 american musician chuck lavelle who was a member of the allman brothers band during the height of their 1970s popularity he's the longtime keyboardist and musical director with the rolling stones and lavelle has also toured and recorded with eric clapton george harrison david gilmore and john mayer born on this day 1952 Born April 28, 1953, Kim Gordon, bassist, artist, record producer, video director, and actress. She has sung and played bass and guitar in the alternative rock band Sonic Youth. Born on this day, 1968, Howard Donald of Take That. And born on this day, 2003, happy birthday, iTunes. On this day, 2003, Apple launched the very first iTunes store, the first widely successful legal music download service. Available only to Mac users, the iTunes store let U.S.-based customers download the music they wanted for just 99 cents per song without subscription fees. Apple also offered groundbreaking personal use rights, including burning songs onto an unlimited number of CDs for personal use and playing songs on up to three Macintosh computers. Happy birthday, iTunes. On this day in history, April 28, 1973, Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon went to number one in the U.S. 
The album went on to enjoy record-breaking 741 discontinuous weeks on the Billboard charts and has now sold over 45 million copies worldwide. On this day, 1982, the California State Assembly Consumer Protection Committee heard testimony from quote-unquote experts who claimed that when Stairway to Heaven was played backwards, it contained the words, I sing because I live with Satan. The Lord turns me off. There's no escaping it. Here's to my sweet Satan, whose power is Satan. He will give you 666. I live for Satan. Quite a claim. On this day, 2008, Scott Weiland Singer with the Stone Temple Pilots, excuse me, was sentenced to 192 hours in county jail for his November 2007 drunk driving offense. He was also fined $2,000, required to complete an 18-month alcohol program, and was placed on probation for four years. And finally, on, a, on this day, 2014, Scorpions drummer James Kotak was sentenced to one month in jail in Dubai for offensive behavior after an incident at, at the Dubai airport on the 3rd of April. He was convicted of insult, insulting Islam, raising his middle finger, and being under the influence of alcohol at the Dubai airport. Tough day. And that's it for this day in history. Back over to you, Peter. Right on. And on this day in probably 1980, whenever it was, uh, you could find me playing Zeppelin IV backwards on a record player, spinning it around with my finger, trying to hear it. Trying to find that. Trying to find it. And then uh, pulling out all the Beatles records and Paul is a dead man, miss him, miss him, miss him. And Revolution Number 9. So sometime this day in history, that was me. And something that the kids are missing out this day is the art of playing a record backwards. Or, you know, or the art of, you know, being able to play it at half speed or, you know, when you're when the tape was wearing out and it would kind of go taffy pull faster, slower, faster, slower. Mm-hmm. You know, kids are missing out. You know, wow and flutter is a thing. So uh, yeah, let's uh, we're going to start in just a second. So this is uh, welcome, everybody. This is where we scout the World Wide Web for music business news that we think should be open for discussion. We're going to begin very shortly. First, want to welcome everybody also on our video live streams as well. And over here in Clubhouse and how this works is probably for the first 20 or 30 minutes. We open we read headlines from and news from the articles where you can find and play along at home is at musicindustrycity.com. Click at the Clubhouse Information Center graphic and that'll give you a link to the show notes which has all the articles headlines and their links and we keep that going throughout all, all the week and then we get to the friday week in review uh you know so if you just want to tune in to more music industry city program click that little green clubhouse icon at the top and also uh eli what is uh what you know is going on for this friday we're, we're going to start like doing something this friday where we do the week in review but we want to have it a little different like wh- what's your thoughts on that for a second like what what we want to just make this a party on friday a party on friday yeah well, the week in review you know, party a week in review party well we'll have to have spotify balloons for sure whatever else we do <laughs> right on and as always we do have the spotify spot so let's get into it Wow, that was a lot of fun there. Hold on, let me fix that. All right, we're just going to go right in there. <laughs> you know, I've been having little gremlins in my computer all day, and, it, you know, my mouse actually stopped working just before I started this. So something happened in the, like, the hour before. So uh, we always have a little fun. And I've learned to laugh at myself a little bit more when things like that happen. So I hope everybody got a kick out of that. But now we're going to get into the serious news. And this is, uh, you know, good news from across the board. We have New York, and this is from NBCNewYork.com and also based on from the CDC mask guidance. So the title is New York adopts new CDC mask guidance. Cuomo says top city advisor warns of challenges. Mayor Bill de Blasio, senior public health advisor, says New York presents some unique challenges as far as an end to the outdoor mask mandate. Meanwhile, Governor Andrew Cuomo will open all New York state run mask vaccine sites to walk ins for all eligible areas. What they break this down is what to know is the CDC says people don't need to wear masks outside if alone or with family, whether they're vaccinated or not. Non vaccinated people should still mask up at outdoor restaurants and gatherings, though. New York City's mayor says the city, quote, can certainly work with that. 
while the governor said New York will adopt the new CDC mask guidelines and open all state-run mask vaccine sites to walk-ins for age 16 plus on Thursday. Mask mandates and other mitigation protocol have remained in effect across the tri-state for more than a year. Connecticut is poised to drop all remaining business restrictions except indoor mask rules starting May 19th. Laura Cuomo said Tuesday that New York State has adopted this, uh, indicating the change would take effect immediately. It is the most significant recovery step from a daily life standpoint for the one-time epicenter of pandemic so far. He described the change as, quote, liberating as he made the announcement barely an hour after the CDC issued an updated guidance. Uh, the mayor's top public health advisor said the city wants to review the new recommendations in more detail before rolling out any sweeping changes to citywide COVID protocol. It wasn't clear if the state health department would issue updated guidelines as early as Tuesday. Dr. Rochelle Walensky, director of the Centers for Disease Control, lays out a guidance for what people fully vaccinated against COVID-19 can safely do indoors and outdoors. According to the new CDC guideline, people don't have to wear masks outside when they walk, bike or run alone or with family members, whether they are fully vaccinated or not. Fully vaccinated people don't need to wear masks at outdoor gatherings or at outdoor restaurants, the CDC says. Non-vaccinated people should. And everyone should mask up in crowded outdoor situations regardless of vaccination vaccination status, the CDC says. Quote, this, that raises some challenges for places as dense as New York City where crowded indoor, outdoor situations are a practical norm. Uh, it goes on. It also has a mask guidance graphic here in this article, uh, and it goes on a lot deeper. Uh, this is, you know, we're going to have to keep uh, they're saying we're going to have to keep mask restrictions in place in the city until we're 100 percent sure we're out of the woods. And the best way to know we're out of the woods is to see those vaccination numbers go up and up and up just with the number of people vaccinated so far. It is just pushing down covid, pushing down the cases and making the city safer. So far, New York City has fully vaccinated more than 2.4 million people, which is 28.8% of its population. That's almost exactly halfway to de Blasio's June goal. Statewide, 31.9% of New Yorkers are fully vaccinated. And Cuomo simplified the process again Tuesday, announcing all state-run mass vaccine sites will allow walk-ins for age 16 and over. All right, so yeah, it goes on a lot more. It is a very, it's a great article, uh, you know, talks about with the Biden administration and the CDC outlines, but it's uh, the NBCNewYork.com. You can find it there. Anybody have some thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to chime in really quick and to say that I'm really glad that, that New York is getting so many people vaccinated. And uh, that's just that's really great. I've got a lot of friends there from Berkeley, so I feel really great about that. And um, the, 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 the new mask mandate seems pretty reasonable, I think. So that's that's this is great. Right on. Thank you for that. Yeah. And it's going to be really interesting. You know, the. Um you know, what's going to kind of affects, and we're going to tie this into a few, an article in just a moment that has to do with outdoor concert that happened last week and about permits going for, uh, for further. So we got to kick over to the SBA. Uh, this is a quick update, and this is in Hypot. 17,000 apply for the SBA SVOG funds in the first 24 hours. The article starts more than 17,000 indie musicians, uh, sorry, indie music venues, agents and others eligible for 16 billion in desperately needed shuttered venue operating grants applied in the first 24 hours, according to the SBA. Quote, as of noon Eastern today, 24 hours open, the SVOG portal received 17,356 applications and of those 9,472 have been started and 7,884 have been submitted, an SBA spokesperson told Variety. Hope returned for struggling venues on Monday after the SBA finally began taking applications after multiple false starts. Elliot, I know you've been following this. You have any, uh, you have any, did you uh, have to be involved with any of that uh have you heard any other uh, you know feedback from people that did apply i was not involved directly with the process but i was in uh close communication with the people uh that were doing it for my theater just because i do care you know even though it, it is not part of my responsibilities um <clears throat> and they said you know the relaunch went pretty smooth you know there was talk of it opening on friday on uh, saturday and there was a lot of public outcry about the Saturday 
you know, doing it on a weekend. So they actually moved the date at the last minute. And uh, apparently it, it, it kind of went pretty smooth, which is, you know, a relief, but a little surprising, you know, so I'm glad it went well. Right on. Yeah. You, you could see there was a, they had some tweets in there, you know, saying that, you know, people had a good experience with it. You know what I happened to see earlier in my Facebook news feed and it was a sponsored ad and I, and I can't remember the company, uh, but what they were offering is to fill out your SVOG grant application for you. And this was really interesting because you went to the site and people were asking questions such as how much of a cut are you going to take? How much is this going to cost me? And of course, you know, that those weren't answered in, in you know, in that thread, but you know, it was a sponsored ad. So you don't always, you're not going to see the, you know, the comments all the time. But the thing is you look at this and there, you fill out, I went to the site out of interest and you have to fill out an application to them. Then they contact you, set up a meeting, pitch to you like how they're going to do, and they offer some financial advice. They get you, help you with your, collect your documents. They submit it on your behalf. One of the concerns about this grant was how much, how quickly the, the funds are going to run out. So get in, apply as quickly as possible. Is this just... You know, a company, I, I don't know much about the company. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything about this. But, you know, the amount of time I see filling out an application for the company to contact you to then ask for all your paperwork anyway and ask you all the questions that you have to submit anyway, which are going to be the same questions on the form. I mean, you, you know, any thoughts on, you know, what has anybody heard of this company that, you know, is doing or seen it or has anybody seen other companies trying to do this? Well, I haven't seen anything like that, but, uh, you know, I could see a smaller, uh, operation where, you know, some people open small venues just, you know, cause they're a musician or an engineer or, you know, just love the music or whatever, and might not have the best, uh, you know, record keeping business acumen. You know, we have, we have a, you know, a fantastic office staff that you know are, are not necessarily in it because they're music fans they're in it because that's their their jobs you know they're, they're accountants they're you know and lawyers and stuff like that so you know i could see it being valuable for some people but i would be wary of you know people trying to you know steal financial information and all that stuff and i will also say that as you touched on how the money's going to be distributed and how long it's going to take there was uh in the uh guidance they said that venues that lost uh 90 percent of their income during pandemic would be considered first and then uh 75 percent of their income second and 50 percent third so that there's a breakdown of of need uh, as to how it's going to be distributed and then in, in each of those categories it was you know first come based on the uh, uh the uh number of your application which were sequential Right. Yeah. It's, I, I just, I look at it as even if I am, I, I don't have great business acumen. If I go to the website and they say, we need your quarterly return, your annual returns, P and L statement. And I don't have that. I'm just using, I mean, like everybody really has to have that, but QuickBooks can generate that for you. But I'm just using it as an example is if you don't have that, there's no difference between you not having it for you filling out the form directly as opposed to the company saying you have to submit your P&L form to us and then we're going to go submit it on your behalf. And then it's just adding extra delays. Yeah, it just seems like a redundant service yeah. for, for sure. Yeah. yeah, so I always say, like, be careful, be wary of these kind of companies. And it just seems like it's one of those companies that just popped up just for this because I think the website is as SVOG in it, the URL. So, and it's just like a very generic kind of thing. So, uh, you know, just always do your research. And I think, uh, you know, to quote Chris, who's in the audience, you know, don't listen to anything anybody says on here and uh, always go do the research yourself. So that's what we're saying. Make sure you look into that. All right. Uh, going forward, the city, New York City, this one is in the Gothamist. Uh, we covered this on Monday, I believe it was, about uh, the hardcore show that was held in Tompkins Square Park over the weekend and it was for 2,000 people and 
I think there was probably one person with a mask in there. So this, uh, there's been some fallout from that, and this co- covers it. As a uh, city says, jam-packed Tompkins Square Park hardcore show applied for permit permit as quote September 11th memorial. So it starts off last Saturday, thousands of people packed into Thompson Square Park for a free hardcore show that appears to have wound up being the largest city permitted concert in New York City since the pandemic began. The massive crowd of mostly maskless concert goes left some wondering how the city allowed a show this large to happen when officials say COVID-19 remains a serious threat in New York City. But according to the permit application approved by the Parks Department, this was never supposed to be a concert. Organizers had been given permission for a, quote, September 11th memorial political rally. The permit application for the September 11th memorial was submitted on November 2nd of 2020 by organizer Chris Parker with an email associated with The Shadow, an underground newspaper distributed on the Lower East Side. The Parks Department says that this organization has booked events at the park since at least 2006. The description for this particular event was listed as a, quote, political rally with speakers and music according to copies of paperwork shared with the Gothamist. Earlier this year, the event date was switched to April 24th, but the name and the description of the event were not updated. Saturday's concert, which was organized by Black and Blue Productions, featured Madball, Murphy's Law, and a bunch of others. Uh, In a statement on Instagram, Black and Blue Productions denied that the event was listed as a 9-11 memorial, but a copy of the permit application provided to Gothamist does identify the event as a September 11th memorial. And you can see this in the article. And it's going on, quote, I'm sure most people know the media lies almost all the time, Black and Blue Production statement declares, but just for shits and giggles, the permit says nothing about 9-11 memorial on it. I had the permit in my hand, fucking asshats, had look at it again to make sure, but there's nothing on it that says 9-11 memorial. The Parks Department told Gothamist that several details about the nature of the event were misrepresented, including the fact that the organizer stated that 100 people would be in attendance, not the 2,000 plus who showed up. The Parks Department said that they, quote, generally would not permit an event of this size in the park, even if the city was not in the midst of a pandemic. Organizers drove a vehicle into the park, which a Parks Department spokesperson said they had not gotten permission to do so. They brought in a stage, which was not listed on the permit application, and used amplified sound in conjunction with it. And the event was misrepresented to the Parks Department as a political rally, not as a concert. Uh, so, you know, they go on a little bit more here. Um, and goes the although the Parks Department has revoked permits for seven upcoming events by this organi- organizer, that includes two events that have already been approved. Another hardcore show planned for May 8th featuring a whole bunch of other artists. Um, there were five other pending events, all listed as, quote, rallies, and all standing attendance would be 100 people. All of these have been revoked, including a pair of dates commemorating the Tompkins Square Park ride in August and a Halloween rally in October, according to the Parks Department. Quote, these guys misrepresented their intentions on their application and Parks rightfully took action, said Mitch Schwartz, a spokesperson for the mayor's office. Um, I'm going to talk about Assemblymember uh, Harvey Epstein. He says that he was shocked when he learned that the Parks Department had issued permit and hope officials are more careful about checking the permits in the future. Quote, I'd like to see much better oversight by the Parks Department. He said, if there is a permit issued for an event, I hope that they actually manage and ensure it's appropriate. If they had looked at the permit here, they'd know they weren't entitled to a stage and could have shut it down right away. Whew. That one show really... uh. He stirred up a lot of outrage, and uh, I guess you might say rightfully so, and misrepresented it. Anybody uh, hear any more of this or some thoughts? I'm I'm just really bummed that, you know, I, I hate to put it this way, but it feels like one misbehaving kid ruined recess for the whole class, you know? Yeah, and I don't, I don't have any information about this specific event except for the fact that I've been, you know, following this story. But uh, I do know that the Parks Department in New York City does not mess around. They are very, very, very uh, on it with their uh, enforcement. And just like you said, that mere fact that they brought in a vehicle like that has serious consequences. I've seen them put uh, audio engineers in handcuffs when they don't uh, comply with uh, curfews. You know, guys, you know, that have the do you know who I am? Do you know who my band is kind of attitudes? And, uh, you know, so they're, they're, they're serious. If you tear up the lawn and, it, you know, there's huge fines. If you break tree branches, there's huge fines. So uh, I, I, would, I would 
think that these people are not going to get any permits in the future, to say the least. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Wayne. this is very. Oh, sorry, <laughs> this is this is very serious. Um, I, I I worry that you know we might see more things like this happen across the country in different in different cities where people try to you know you give them an inch they take a mile kind of approach and um, yeah this is this is really not good. I'm 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 with Eli on this and it really does feel like the the kid who misbehaved and ruined recess for the whole class. I like that. I'm kind of happy it happened in New York out of all places, though, than, say, Texas or somewhere. I mean, Texas could have done it legally, but, you know, somewhere else where it just they could have turned into something a lot different, too, though. In what way would it uh, turned into something different? As in, like, it could have become a whole pol- more of a political issue and people would have been like, oh, I have a right for this. I don't need to be wearing my mask. I, you know, even if their state sold, like, you know, for sure says that you have to be wearing a mask and their cases might be surging like Michigan. I don't know. In that type of way, like turn into not about even, you know, the music side of things, but like turn into like, you know, 2000 people angry about that. (laughs) Well, if you watch some of the YouTube videos from the uh, earlier story, you know, that first reported that this event happens, there was a lot of anti-mask, anti-vax, anti-lockdown rhetoric coming off the stage. So, uh, you know, turn this into a political discussion, but, uh, that, that there is some of that going on. Yeah, I had friends leave that actually were spoke, wanted to go and like saw what was going on and then turned around immediately. Yeah, I mean, they they, they said, you know, because it was touted when in the premiere, it was like a political rally. There is something in the article that talks about one of the singers got on stage to, you know, to, uh, you know, speak on some topics just before they started their set. So I guess they that means they look at it as they fulfilled their quota of calling it a political rally by saying a few words and then kicking off their set. You know, and I want to also agree with, uh, you know, Elliot, like, don't mess with the New York City Parks Department. And I've worked with other divisions of the uh, mayor's office. And when it comes to working with Parks Department, I mean, wonderful people. But they are very strict to, like, you know, guidelines that are in place. And I can even say, I'll share something really quick. Well, there's going to be a beer mile run at McCarran Park. And it was on a private Facebook group. And Parks found out about it. And they contacted the organizers and said, don't do it. And, you know, because everybody's talking about, okay, five o'clock on Tuesday, we're all going to do a beer mile. And Park said, don't do it. And Park showed up with their SUVs and parked them right there by the track to make sure that they weren't doing it. And they were talking to clubs, the running clubs, because the some people that were associated with different uh, Brooklyn running clubs. So, yeah, don't mess with the Parks Department. Yeah, they, they, they care about Parks the park way more than they care about yeah. people and that's and that, that's good on them and i thank them for it <laughs> it's, it's not a bad thing this is a good thing we need that all right uh going back to you know we're going to go into let's talk about uh this is four takeaways from pasquale rotella's heated edc las vegas reddit ama yes after the cancellation he got on reddit for an ama so uh you know, and you knew some people were not going to be happy about it. And this was from EDM.com. Again, you can find links to the articles that we're talking about in the show notes at musicindustrycity.com. Click on the Clubhouse Information Center graphic and you can get access to the show notes document, which has all the news that we cover throughout the week. All right. So this one, in the wake of the contentious postponement of EDC Las Vegas, the festival's proprietor, Squall Rotel, rocked the plank in a heated Reddit AMA the other day. All right. The the biggest thing that, you know, they the one takeaway here is like he addressed a con- controversial statement when Rotella first announced that EDC Las Vegas would move forward with its planned May dates. He told prospective attendees, quote, book your flights, hotels and shuttles in an Instagram post that has since been deleted. The statement proved to be a controversial one for obvious reasons. In response to the question from a fan who asked Rotella how he plans on, quote, taking responsibility for the millions of dollars your fans lost in non-refundable flights and hotels, the CEO founder said, Your question is based on a misconception that I announced EDC when we knew it was not happening. I've never moved forward with the show unless there was a clear path for the show to take place. EDC in May was no different. Regarding flights and hotels, when I first suggested that headliners begin looking at travel arrangements in my Instagram post on March 25th, 
I encouraged everyone to review the cancellation policy on their flight and hotel reservations before booking just in case. Thankfully, many headliners were able to do just that. For those who missed that post or were unable to go that route, we will continue to work with every single ticket holder who has reached out to help them mitigate their loss one by one. It's great that you and others have brought up this question up, but I hope it brings you ease to know that many of the people who initially reached out to us with their travel issues have been able to go back to the airlines and hotels and successfully resolve their issues. Um, so there are, you know, they talk about what happened the days between the converse. Uh, I, I encourage everybody, if you were interested in hearing about more, there was another article that we covered uh, yesterday or the day before, and that is also in the show notes. And it talks about a timeline of what happened during the week from the like, two weeks from the announcement to the cancellation. And it talks about they were still going forward and their permits were getting rejected on top of then, you know, uh, Las, uh, Nevada changing some of the guidelines. So it, it is really interesting to see. And I encourage you, if you're, if you are following this to read up on those. And if anybody has any thoughts on this. And with that being said, Eli, why don't we go over to the weather report? All right, let's take a look at the weather. We, of course, have listeners streaming in from all over the world. Thank you so much for checking us out on many different platforms across the World Wide Web and also on Clubhouse for iOS. Let's take a look at the weather where you are. Today in your local weather, the weather thinks you're beautiful. Back over to you, Peter. I love that. <laughs> that's that. I, I like those weather reports. I think that's the best one yet. And uh, it's, you they, know, it's, I think it's important to remember the weather thinks you're beautiful today. Yes, and I wonder if you can hear Christina Aguilera singing in the background from the from this from the skies from the clouds. Anyway, I, I can, but we can't play it in the newsroom. So I know. Uh, if anybody wants to also join in the conversation, we are going to be getting to the roundtable shortly. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand, and uh, you know if there's something that we missed. Uh, you can also bring that to the table, and that's why we call it the round table. So this one is from Music Week. More than 2,000 songwriters and artists call for minimum daily allowance. And so our article starts off, over 2,000 songwriters and artists have signed an open letter to all record labels calling for writers to be paid a minimum daily allowance of 75 pounds. So we are going to keep this into uh, British pounds. The payment would be for each songwriter working with an artist to cover expenses. The letter also calls for at least four points on the master from the label share. The letter is part of a hashtag pay songwriters campaign from the Ivers Academy, which had been backed by independent labels, VAC Collective and Cooking Vinyl, independent music company, The Other Songs, and Music Producers Guild, Songwriters of North America, the 100 percenters who campaign for the creative community. Songwriters that have signed the letter since the campaign include Autumn Rowe, who has written for Dua Lipa, Kylie and the Saturdays, and a whole bunch of others here. It goes into more detail, and people have written for you know Ed Shear in One Direction. So Autumn Rose said, quote, I am at the point where I'd rather not write at all than take a session for an artist without a sound yet and no real plan of action. Too often it is normalized that writers are supposed to write for free with an artist because something might happen a couple of years down the line. I can't continue to pay to develop other people's brands, which I have no personal stake in. I want to stress there are zero harsh feelings against any of the artists I've worked with. I've loved them all in a special way and we gladly work with them again. This is more of just how the system functions and how overlooked songwriters are many times. We deserve so much more than we get. All of us do. And that's a big statement that she was saying is I can't continue to pay to develop other people's brands, which I have no personal stake in. So, you know, that's something that's a big takeaway. Um, there's also an additional letter of the D, uh, DCMS committee inquiry into the economics of streaming and also from the chair, uh, Helene Linval, who is the chair of the Ivers Academy Songwriting Committee and says that the per diem would be non-recoupable from the artist share and points should be on the net revenue and shared amongst the non-performing songwriters on record. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is an interesting thing. There's always, you know, publishers like to get songwriters together for co-writes or in writing for an artist. And, you know, now they're looking at us kind of like the per diem in a sense. But if they're talking about, you know, 75 uh, and a daily allowance, uh, it's kind of interesting. And I, you know, would love to hear anybody's thoughts on that. Yeah, I raised my hand on this one because... I mean, songwriters have always been undermined. It's kind of like since the beginning of the industry, 
they've always been taken advantage of. I mean, they've always been paid less, even in terms of royalties and splits and everything. Um, yeah, I remember, wasn't there like something circulating like last year, the last couple of years where they were trying to, you know, get their rights and groups together to to make this happen. But I think this is just one country we're referring to, right? Yeah, there has been, I, and we actually, we, we talked about it last week or maybe even earlier this week, was there's also these songwriting committees, you know, organizations coming together. And one of the issues that they're really focusing on, which has been around since the dawn of songwriting, is, you know, giving away percentage just to the artists or somebody else that had no writing credits on there. So on top of it, you know, this is when I focused on, you know, building a brand or for somebody that doesn't have a sound yet, or I'm helping to build their brand. It's like, you're doing it for free because the, you might get a percentage, but you don't, the song might not go anywhere, but also then if you are working on something and then later it goes, all right, we're going to go to studio with this. And you know, now the artist wants a piece of your writer share because, and that is another thing that is a big challenge and that's being brought more to light as of recent. I think it's the thing as well that, you know, the recent call for songwriters and the songwriter groups to, to write that letter to the Recording Academy for the minimum delivery and release commitment cl uh, clause. The, these are all like parts of a whole. These are all things trying to look at publishing and say, how can we be more equitable? Why are we allowing the labels to essentially take 80% of money from digital income, we're left at 20%, and still the artist is looking for cuts, is, is looking for publishing share of that 20% when they didn't write it. So, you know, short of an actual <laughs> full uh, collective bargaining strike on writing and licensing music, you know, it, it's just a lot of people kind of showing inequity. Um and uh, you're, I'm kind of glad of it, you know, across the world. It's not just a case of this is just happening in the US, it's happening in the UK. And we're seeing, you know, songwriting groups, you know, I don't think we're going to see PROs come out about this. I think we're very much going to see like NMPA and uh, songwriter groups talking about this in the States. We're not going to see other people who essentially are just kind of moving the money around uh, having says in this. But um, I, I do think it's an extremely interesting thing. A lot of my students this year on my music publishing lectures are, are writing about these um, and it's just for them, it's kind of quite empowering because they're seeing this theory and then they're seeing the practical application of the inequity of it. So that's all from me. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for that update. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, there is something that I'm going to tie in with this uh, is the, uh, from completemusicupdate.com. And they're talking about uh, the title is Music Credit Fund Launches to Offer Alternative Finance Options to Music Makers. So I'll just read from this a little bit. A new finance company targeting the music industry unveiled its services earlier this week with former AIM chief Allison Wenham and veteran artist manager Tim Clark among its advisors. The company says that its aim is to allow music makers and music companies operating at a certain level to access affordable finance without having to do without having to do deals that involve the assignment of copyrights to business partners, such as labels or publishers or other investment funds that have entered the music industry with rights acquisition as a main objective. Or in the words of the music credit fund itself, it will offer artists and other rights holders, quote, long-term competitively priced loans secured solely against intellectual property assets and or future income streams across all music industry sectors. It adds, for individual songwriters or artists, the MCF will provide a particularly attractive alternative to those who prefer to retain ownership of their personal creative output. For companies, MCF funds can be used for any business-related purpose such as acquisitions or business development. For owner-managed companies, it can provide an opportunity to raise capital whilst retaining control and independence. Uh, so the fund has been launched by Jack McDonald of Alvearium Investments, who says exiting acquisition models and restrictive debt offerings shouldn't be the only way to access funding in the music industry. The last few years have seen a growth in understanding and confidence in the space, and in our view, this should lead to more evolved, fairer options for creatives. A music credit fund will offer the industry the opportunity to secure finance against their intellectual property and revenue streams whilst maintaining full ownership of the businesses and copyrights that they have created. All right. 
And uh, Alison Wenham also goes on to say, the MCF will be a competitive and global finance solution for the whole industry. We are providing a transparent, equitable, and elegant solution to companies, content owners, and artists who require finance, but above all, wish to retain their rights. You know, Aaron, this uh, this is also kind of in your neck of the woods a little bit. Uh, have you heard uh, anything about this? It's a it's an interesting area. Obviously, now when you say my neck of the woods, just for everyone's like, full disclosure, I, I'm a director on a capital investment fund. So, you know, if we're being treated like the bad guy here, I suppose we'll, we'll give some context. Um, the the idea that people would want to sell their intellectual property assets is on the basis of them needing cash. Um, maybe they're looking to take the risk out of, you know, what may come down the road for the next, you know, 70 years or the life of their copyright going forward. They can either identify a valuation for the last three to five years and, and earn a multiple of that. So it could be that they could earn eight or 10 or 12 or 15 times what they've earned over the last three to five years to sell that asset to a fund who essentially will manage that for investors going forward. But they're making out, you know, uh, quite well out of it for for that initial sale, it'll it'll pay off the the mortgage. It'll help them buy a house. It'll help them fund new projects. Um, for this, I mean, there are other competitors. There, there's there's sound royalties. You know what they're trying to do now with the music credit fund. You know, it is a bank. It is a loan. They are securing against your assets. So you know, in the instance where this doesn't work out, I mean, you're kind of stuck there with trying to you know pay this back. Um, it is also a case where. I remember Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics. He he tried to do this. He was looking to do this and set up this musician's bank. And, you know, I, I do remember him selling to hypnosis, um, you know, after after talking about that. So there, there kind of has to, there, there is there are the realities of of when a large amount of money is put in front of you, um, what sort of path are you going to take? Now, he may be trying to set this up and trying to fund his own kind of bank as well, because I know that was very much what he wanted to do. It is interesting. I know that a lot of people are very interested in retaining their copyrights, um, but I think it all comes down to education in terms of how to positively exploit your copyrights. And I think that, you know, a lot of people could be sitting on gold. A lot of people might be sitting on assets that are doing okay and will continue to do okay. And what they might be better doing is actually in the short term, getting a lot of capital together to fund the type of life that they want to have. So I'm not, I'm not here in a sales pitch. It's just that thing that it suits different people. It's not for everyone and not everyone can command the large sale prices that we see here. So if someone wants to keep their copyright and someone wants to essentially go to, for all intents and purposes, a bank that understands their business model, what it is that they do, where the money comes from. Because, you know, going into a bank manager nowadays and, and trying to sit down, you know, bringing in your guitar, on, that's, that's what it feels like. You know, it feels like I'm going to have to go in now with my guitar and bring a prop in and try to sell the idea of this to a bank. There's a lot of money coming into into copyright. There's a lot of new money from the financial sector coming in. And I think a lot of people are kind of being more and more aware of this, which is where the impetus for this is coming from. Yeah, it's not like you have to go mortgage your guitar. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is different. And, and I think, you know, funny, we look, there's been different models out there. There's companies that have said, you know, we will, you know, lo loan you money based on your future royalties so they're taking some of your sound, uh, sound exchange payments, things like that. And it's, you know, it's, I, I can't stress enough that if you're a musician, please take a finance course, go online, take, you know, a any kind of course just in finance, it will change your life just to understand basic finance and accounting you will look at money as a different way. You will look at what you have as a business. You will appreciate profit and loss. It's it's something that, you know, when you can actually get to the point where you're looking forward to, and some people do, some people don't, but looking forward to like, hey, I need to see what I was doing this month. How do I make it better next month? Where's all my royalty streams? What's what? What are my collections? What's my revenue this month? What's my budget? It becomes so much better, I I personally think. Uh, but I can't stress it enough. Definitely just take some, I mean, there's gotta be something on Coursera or their online courses, or you know, find somebody that can teach you and just get, take some kind of finance course. I hope you all enjoy your cash flow forecasts. It's gonna be great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I liken it to trying to, to budget your, uh, your paychecks if you don't have any kind of a budget. If you have no idea what you should be spending on groceries or 
rent or transportation or anything else according to your paycheck, then it's really difficult to make that paycheck stretch. So it's the same thing for musicians. Really, really understand how how those finances work. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've worked, you know, seen bands where, hey, how much did you get paid for tonight's gig? Oh, we made a hundred bucks. I'm like, how much alcohol did you buy for you and your friends that you bought a drink for your friends that you gave a comp to? So they didn't even pay to get in, but you still bought them a drink. Uh, I'm like, yeah, go look at that bar tab and now just write in one column how much you made and then the next column how much you paid. So you basically just got paid 125 bucks from the bar, from the venue, and you just handed it back to them. It starts there. That the, the business model felt, it feels a little backhanded because, I mean, obviously you really have to believe in what you're doing to even go down that route, like confident that no problem, I'll go into some debt, I'll take a loan. But at the same time, that it sounds like the company is trying to sell something like wolf and snake wolf and sheep's clothing kind of aspect but yeah i mean they're clearly not going to lose out that's you can see the give and the take you know well, i mean it's one i think if the- you kind of look at it just just from this perspective of a label or a publisher i mean when they give you that advance that's recoupable when they expense you depending on your contract that's recoupable and you know depending on where you are in your business model and you know you don't want to lose control of your assets you may want to go with someone like this but the t's and c's are so important and and whether or not you know you can do that uh, finance course but to actually sit down and read the term sheets of some of these loans would be most beneficial to everyone here that you know it's not it's not the you know the worst case scenario would be i don't know i'm trying to think of an equivalent i'm going to call them payday loans so the idea that you go out there and say oh are you are you, are you do you need something to tide you over until your next payday um, why don't we give you this loan with a thousand percent APR? And you're like, that's crazy. But you don't realize it because you need that money so bad. And then you're tied into huge interest rates uh, for the next 12, 24, 36 months. So just as the the industry opens up to this model, uh, just be aware, T's and C's. There might be some very good terms. There might be some extremely bad terms out there. So just be aware. And as Aaron mentioned before, it's not for everybody. So some people might, you know, ours might not be at that level and they can look at something else. But again, you know, understanding finance T's and C, you know, understanding the T and C's. I mean, not knowing what you're signing. I mean, does anybody remember the 2008 global crash uh, housing? I mean, they didn't know what they were signing. That was it. They were being sold, you know, a bag of goods. You know, just basically that's what led to it is a lot of people didn't know what they were signing. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we're going to find we're going to follow up and with the last one of the day. And that is going to be Spotify. The big green dot. It hits the spot. We are headed into our music news power hour Spotify spot. But before we do, I want to take just a quick moment and reset the room and welcome everybody who is joining us, not only on Clubhouse for iOS, but across streaming platforms all over the world on the World Wide Web. So thanks for tuning in and listening. This is the Music News Power Hour, where we cover all the music news that you actually want to hear about and discuss. And if you are in the Clubhouse room, you'd like to contribute to our conversation, and we have not yet invited you to the stage, please don't be offended. We're probably reading something, or maybe we haven't seen you yet, so please feel free to raise your hand here in the Music News Power Hour, where we bring a whole new meaning to the phrase, hands up. It doesn't work the same way here as it does in the club but if you have something to say please throw your hand up we'll be happy to bring you to the stage we're going to head into our last article here and then we're going to open the discussion up for our round table peter over to you right on headline. thanks all right this is in billboard and again you can see all the headlines at musicindustrycity.com click on clubhouse information center graphic and find the show notes and that'll have all the li- links to the article so this is a uh, spotify Quarterly revenue grows 16% as paid subscribers tick up to 158 million. So subscri- Spotify added 3 million subscribers to the first quarter of 2021 and wrapped up March with a total of 158 million subscribers and 208 million free listeners. The company announced Tuesday morning its latest earning release. Revenue increased 16% to $2.6 billion, and we're going to be speaking in U.S. dollars here. From 2.22 billion in the same period last year, gross margin, the remainder of the royalty after royalties and other content associated was 25.5 percent of total revenue in line with previous quarters. 
All right, Spotify and many other streaming services fared well during the pandemic as people spent more time at home and could not attend concerts or visit movie theaters. Subscriber growth did not stall in 2020, although Spotify's free service was hit by the company's sudden and sharp pullback of advertising spending. First quarter subscription growth of 3 million from the fourth quarter of 2020 was the slowest, lowest quarterly growth rate in number of subscribers since the third quarter of 2017 and well below the 8 million, 6 million, and 11 million subscribers added in the second, third, and fourth quarters of 2020. But 3 million subscribers were at the high end of Spotify's guidance of 155 million to 158. So, uh, it goes into, I mean, we're talking about finances. It goes into, you know, gross margin, operating profit, uh, free cash flow. So all the, you know, for, for the people that love that, go to the Billboard article. Uh, listener metrics. So, you know, total listeners are 356 million. And again, that's 158 million subscribers and ad supported listeners free that are 208 million. All right. So, you know, the, some key events where they launched in over 80 news markets, including South Korea, and rolled out 36 new languages on mobile, acquired Betty Labs, maker of live audio app Locker Room, launched a redesigned de- desktop app and web player, and notable events in the second quarter of 2021. Spotify's Anchor podcast app gives podcast creators the option to offer subscriber-only podcasts. The launch of the car thing, still the worst name, a standalone piece of hardware for listening to Spotify in the car and a new Facebook app for listening to Spotify within the Facebook app on iOS and Android. And that is it for the news reads. All right. If there's anybody that has something they wanted to chime in about, there's a particular topic that we covered, or if there's something else that we might have missed that you want to bring to the table, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll bring you up on the stage. You just have about eight minutes left in the room in the power hour. Anybody have some thoughts there? Hey there, this is Cedric. Um, I'm coming in from Los Angeles. I'm a recording artist and I have music on Spotify and Apple Music under Cedric K. Benson. Um, I was very interested in the MCF article and, you know, the whole spell about taking a financial course. So, um, um, bit of a, just like advice maybe um, for someone who's looking to get into an independent artist looking to get into the live touring arena, um, would this be something to look into? Absolutely, and it's so important to take charge of our financial futures, no matter who we are, no matter what our goals are. I, I just wanna echo that great great point, Cedric, and I'm glad you, you brought that up. It's so important to take charge of your financial future. We're moving in here to just the last few minutes of today's Music News Power Hour for this Wednesday. If there are any articles that we discussed today that you'd like to bring back around and open up for just a few more comments, we have about six more minutes left in the Music News Power Hour. So anybody on the stage with a final thought for our articles today? We covered a lot. Um, I'm curious of what y'all think about royalty exchange. I'm not sure if y'all have heard it, where people are like selling their catalogs and getting fronted the royalty money. And the people who own the catalog will apparently make more in the long run on owning their catalog. There have actually been a lot of of news stories about that, Joe Cat. So if you find a headline for us, we would love to cover that. We definitely, we cover headlines in this room that reach all the way across the music industry and touch on all aspects of music. So if you can find a headline on that, we would love to cover it. We do try to cover that as those headlines come up in the news, definitely. Yeah, Royalty, that was one of the, when I, mentioned there are companies out there that do offer advances based on future royalties uh you know that's one of the companies that fall, would fall under their category each one operates differently naturally but there are a few out there and what we suggest is you know look at the track record look at some if you can find any of the artists that they worked with if you know, find out any experiences, talk to any managers. Uh, it's always and, and research and get educated. It, you know, we we bring up you know, you know, you know your finances, terms and conditions, legal notes. I mean, this is when you're when you start playing in on that level, and that's a great place to be. That you have valuable assets that can generate revenue, and you can you know use it for leverage, for advances, things like that. 
If you're at that level, then you can also afford to have a lawyer look at those contracts. You can have somebody as a financial advisor. Well, you know, it doesn't have to be, it's not necessarily you need somebody from Morgan Stanley that's like, oh, we only deal with high net worth people. It, they are, there are financial advisors at all levels for you. I just feel like it's such an interesting concept because who knows if, I mean, obviously the value of a song or a catalog is fluctuating. And if, if the elite of the industry are taking that kind of money, I mean, maybe they'll go live off a $300,000 advance and that's like their year for one song. You know what I mean? It's just, it's really insightful when you see the elite of the industry are actually taking but, it serious. But in advance, in advance, you have to pay it back. Okay. So they ah, can't, right. they, they, they can't, they, the they can't take it, right. the, yeah, this isn't this isn't free money where you're just handed money and you can go do whatever you want with it and live off of it. You, that's what happens and you hear about a lot of these bands and artists that and this was a big thing uh, with you know the with the opulence of the hey, I got my advance and now I'm going to go buy this Ferrari and all this bling and I'm going to show this off a and Cadillac. then their their next song is, you know, a failure it's a bust and they only had that one hit and then they they fizzle and they're still under contract and that advance i mean you hear the stories like advances accumulate uh, being cumulative from one release to another and it's like if you didn't carry over from one album like hey here's the advance for one album well hey you know something we would normally give you an advance from the other album well we can give you that but you still have to collect from the other one so we're going to roll that into this one so i mean there's all these different ways of doing it and it just have to be careful. It's not free money. It's so true. And John, I want to welcome you to the stage. We are moving into just the last couple of moments of today's Music News Power Hour. We try to hold the room to an hour because we're sure you want to get back to your day. But I see that you raised your hand and joined us on the stage. Did you have a, a final comment for us in these last few moments? Hey, yeah, and thanks for the intro as well. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great group that you've got here. Uh, just on, on that last um, topic, really, what's quite interesting with those platforms, I think Songvest is another one. Uh, but what Royalty Exchange seem to be doing as well is that it isn't always just um, someone buying the lights, uh, the rights for the lifetime of the copyright. Um, sometimes it can be for a period of time, and then after that period of time, the the original copyright owner um, will get that back afterwards. Um, so it almost makes it. Uh, a, a nice way for for some artists if they decide to go down that route to to leverage their let's call it an asset early um and for someone else to take that risk for potentially some other income um but in say 15 years if they haven't you know recoup their losses the the artist can still get their rights back so it, it's an interesting model and i think it's going to vary um you know deal by deal but it, it might be quite if if people can um maybe offer it um, to leverage a bit of short-term cash flow in, in the in the short term um, and then um, they don't actually lose their rights in the long term. It makes it quite interesting. That, Song that, that is interesting, John. I'm glad you brought that up and, and came to the stage. I want to I wanna make sure that you come back and join us again because I think that this is an important topic and we do discuss a lot of topics here in the Music News Power Hour room and that's one that I think should, should definitely come to the table again. So thank you for bringing that to the table and thank you for bringing that to our attention. I want to go ahead and take this chance to thank everybody who is listening in today in today's Music News Power Hour, not only on Clubhouse for iOS, but across streaming platforms all over the world and all over the World Wide Web. Thanks for tuning in. The Music News Power Hour is every weekday, Monday through Friday, 12 to 1 Eastern Time, where we scour the World Wide Web for music news headlines that we think are important, and maybe you will too. The back half of our show is opened up for a roundtable discussion. Please raise your hand in the Clubhouse for iOS room and join our discussion in the back half of each Music News Power Hour after we've covered our headlines. We want you to please join us again tomorrow. We're going to have more discussion. We had so many headlines today, we almost ran out of time. So please join us again tomorrow. We're going to have headlines for tomorrow. And then on Friday, we will be doing our special Friday Week in Review. Any conversation we didn't get to wrap up today, we can definitely revisit here in the Music News Power Hour on Friday, 12 to 1 Eastern. On behalf of my co-host, Peter Schwing, I am Eli Window, and I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. This has been Wednesday Music News Power Hour. Right on. Thank you, Eli. Yeah, and just final thing, uh, you know, Song Vessels has the auction platform, so that's a whole different story. And Eli, like you were saying, there were so many articles. I still have 
one, two, I have three articles we didn't even cover. So great conversation today, everybody. Thank you so much. And as Eli said, we will be back tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern. And you can always check out the show notes and links to the articles at musicindustrycity.com. Click on the Clubhouse Information Center graphic, and that'll take you to the show notes. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you, Eli. We're out of here.